Hello, everyone. Dave Lander here from DaveLander.com. This is the week and charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. So what do we talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions. I'm going to have a lot to say about that. We had a lot of interesting developments today, and I'll flesh all that out in a few minutes. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep them relative to the slides. And when we get to the charts, live charts towards the end of the show or the middle of the show, however it works out, you can ask about anything you want. Then also your favorite stock picks. Hold off till we get the live charts on those and ask about one at a time. So what we're going to talk about is our subject. Well, lately, I've been finding old slides and going through a lot of old files and hard drives and such. and I've been finding a lot of good material, if I say so myself. Instead of reinventing the wheel, what I've been thinking about lately is maybe getting some of that old stuff out, old but good, and repurposing a little bit and maybe redo some older presentations. So just kind of scratching the surface there, but there's a lot, there's a lot there. So in the, in that, I found some presentations about why you can't trade. And as I started putting together the slides today, I just kept adding and adding and adding and realized that there's there's a lot more to it than what I'm going to talk about tonight. And the other thing, too, is I was just thinking right before I went live, a lot of you guys are probably a lot more advanced. I know a lot a lot of you guys here tonight live or guys and girls. And it's OK, though. I think it's I think it's important to go back and, and revisit the, va the basics. And one of the slides that I came across and I wish I would have saved it was a slide with uh, Michael Jordan quote. And basically he was saying that there would be a lot more professional athletes if people would just focus on the basics and really get the basics down pat. So I think it's important to revisit this type of trading psychology every so often. And there is some good news as far as, you know, first of all, we're not made to trade. It's very unnatural, strange thing that we do here. And I'll flesh out a little bit that tonight a little bit of that tonight. But then I think in follow-up shows, there's a lot of things we could do to, to to make it not easy, but make it a little easier. And then I also want to touch upon Holy Grail Day hunting, which we were talking about last week. And I have one example. This we're going to show you. This is the claim screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as I'll sum it up, all predictions or about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then, borrowing a line from my buddy Greg Morris. Now, the profit centers are ancillary ways to make some trading profits outside of your core methodology. So my stuff is swing to intermediate term and hopefully much longer. And we do have some in the portfolio that we, at least one, I think we put on last June. We got a couple we put on last fall. And then hopefully, hopefully next fall, next June, we're still in these positions. So that would be fine with me. A lot of times when I tell people I trade, they, they automatically call me a day trader. And it's like, well, yeah, as my wife says, he does a lot of day trades. But that's not the sole focus. However, with the profit centers, if I could go in and take an intraday trade, something like a Russian doll, meaning that we take a, a daily setup and I can go in and just get a little piece intraday off of that, something that's set up as a pullback that could take off and go days, weeks, months, Go in and just get a little piece intraday or possibly in the leverage ETFs. Now, last week, I kind of touched upon a presentation I did last summer. And you might want to go in and watch that if you're watching YouTube on this, just to get up to speed on the volatility research that I did. But it can be a bit of a rabbit hole. And... I got to thinking a little while ago, it's like, well, let me explain why it's it's a rabbit hole. Because if you could figure out the volatility and when that volatility is going to expand and have one of these holy grail days, and the reason I call it a holy grail day is because if you knew when they were really, really close and you could just maybe sit on your hands a little bit and only trade on those holy grail days, you would own the world. And this would not only be just an ancillary way to make money, you'd make a heck of a lot of money doing this. So the volatility in and of itself has a bit of a rabbit hole, so to speak, characteristic. So volatility kind of expands and contracts like a sine wave, but unfortunately, it's not that simple. Sometimes it contracts and contracts and contracts. 
it could get pretty low and stay low for a while before it expands again. So it's at those points in time, I think you have to maybe add in another layer, paying attention to the narrow range bars and inside days and things like that, and maybe get a little bit more liberal in your entries. There's a lot of, there's a four major ETFs I've been focusing on lately, JDust and JNUG, or four pairs, I should say, JDust, JNUG, Sox S, Sox L, Gush Drip, Gush and Drip, and then what's the other one? Oh, Lab D and Lab U. That's the four ones I've been focusing on. In the past, I've tried to add in a whole bunch more, and I found that it just it got pretty complicated. So what I want to do is I want to, again, kind of go back to the basics, right? I want to perfect it in those four liquid ones before I move venture back out into some of these other ones. So ideally, you could get an expansion of volatility and then go in the next day and then bam, just nail that ETF and then sit around and wait for that volatility to contract again because then it's due to, due to expand. It's kind of like a spring getting compressed. But sometimes it contracts and it contracts and it contracts and it contracts. An example to show you just a few minutes, it sort of did that a little bit. And then sometimes it expands and expands or expands and then contracts sharply. You have ever, if you've been trading for a while, you've probably noticed this. Have you ever noticed that someday you have a huge day in the market and then the next day, not so much. It's just kind of a bit of a shoulder shrug, kind of a pause day, so to speak. Now, as I said last week, a holy grail day, and again, go in and watch the one the presentation from last summer, not the last week at Bandcamp. But holy grail day is where it starts at one end and really doesn't trade much above that high for the day and then sells off pretty much the whole day. It ends at the other side of the bar. And I call it HG7. It means it's the, it means it's the widest range bar in seven days and it's also within about 10 percent of the high for downtrends or for a down bar and within 10 percent of the low it never goes within the open that is never goes further than 10 percent below the low of the the entire day's bar now how do you know the range of the entire day the problem with that is you don't so these hg7s or in hindsight, now one thing I, I didn't mention last week, which I was thinking about a little bit today, something that I've experimented in the past with is track the high minus the low intraday and take the absolute value of that and see where it is based on a longer term range to see if you are possibly expanding in range. And if you've got that, that range expansion intraday, then maybe it might be worthwhile trading. And when we get to example, maybe I can flesh that out a little bit better. But essentially, an HG day, all it is, a holy grail day, is when it starts at one end and ends at the other. And if you can hang on, if being a key word in that sentence, on these holy grail days, you'll make a lot of money. And the good news is, knock on wood, not to be not to be smug because I get my ass handed to me quite frequently and, and the ETF trading has been really tough. I only had one real good example to show you this week without thinking too much and digging too far. But I know I've had quite a few losing trades lately because these holy grail days are a little elusive. But the good news is when I go back in and I do find the holy grails in hindsight, I go back and look at my trades for that day. And that day I did really, really well. Usually if, I, if there's an HG day where I don't do well, I'm going to be very upset. So the good news is when I find myself in the middle of an HG day, that's when I make really good money. Unfortunately, there's a lot of other days in between. So again, this is where it's the holy grail hunt. And while I call it an HG day, because it is a holy grail day when it happens, it's just beautiful, is because it, it's hard to pinpoint exactly where they're going to happen. So this research is not... I guess fully formed. It's 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 a research I don't want to throw out there. If you guys want to take the ball and run with it, or if you have some suggestions or whatever, just please let me know, and we'll go from there. So again, opens at the high, opens near the high for the day. Doesn't go much higher, or the high isn't much higher than the open, and then it pretty much sells off for most of the day, and then closes ideally towards the bottom of the bar, and that is again on a wide range bar.
Now, as I said last week, I'm going to go through this pretty quick. So how do you know if you're closing in on one of these elusive Holy Grail days? And that would be your volatility is dropping and ideally at really low levels. Maybe the short-term volatility is compressing where the ratios are less than 50%. Like I said last week, we don't have ratios yet in the ACP platform, and I'm not going to present them with that just yet. Uh, but eventually, we'll see if we can get it in there. And then you might have inside days or a couple of days within a wide range bar. And then maybe after you have a narrow range bar of four, a narrow range bar of seven, or a narrow range bar of 15. This is a Crable type of work, Toby Crable, where you're looking for a very small bar and then you're looking for an expansion out of the bar. So a combination of all these things, possibly the net net price is relatively unchanged or the range itself has compressed. Now remember, Historical volatility only tracks the day-over-day -day price change, okay? It doesn't care about the range, and so I think it's important to incorporate range into this research. I can imagine if somebody's never seen me before, their eyes are probably glazing over by now, but believe me, if you could wrap your head around this concept, you could make a lot of money on these fantastic HG7 days. And some, when I was first doing this research a year or so ago, I've always done volatility research. I kind of went on that volatility rabbit hole many, many years ago. And then I, every now and then I'll, I'll dust off everything, do a little programming and check it out again. But one thing I thought about is like, okay, well, what if you looked at when you haven't had one in a while? That's not going to predict when they're going to occur, but maybe it'll give you a little bit of edge to let you know when they are due to occur. So this is yesterday's drip, I think. And you can see, yeah, all in gas production. Actually, this is, um, yeah, this is drip. So you can see that we had a fairly narrow range of trading over a significant period of time. And we'll take a look at that zoomed in in just one second. Now, it's only been like 10 days since we had the Holy Grail day. And there's your Holy Grail day right there. Now, obviously, the play to have played was Gush. And I think last week, if memory serves, I did make a little on Gush on that day. I don't think I printed money, but I did make a little. But notice going into the Gush, we had a lot of these little indicators that I have programmed on this chart, okay? So we had 15 days where it was relatively, I'm sorry, 50 days where it was a narrow range. We had an inside day here. We had 15 days where the close was relatively unchanged. We did have a little bit of a wide range bar, but it wasn't that big. And then we had a couple of more of these little days of compression and volatility. But as you can see, especially if you're looking at this over here, you could actually get caught up in some choppy range trading. So that's where, and I need to get it up and running again. I changed computers and I got to fix it. But I had an indicator which would measure the high minus the low and take that absolute value and let me know where we are to the ATR. In fact, I'll show you something similar to that in just one second. So back here, you can see up top, we had 32 days before the last HG7. So you go way back in time, and I think it's actually off this chart. You see a little HG5 right here. That's only a five day, but that's probably a pretty good day too. I need to go back in and look at that day. Now I'm looking at it, see if I did okay on that day. So if we zoom it in a little bit, this was again, drip as of yesterday. So right here, this is the narrowest bar in 15 bars. Here's our HG day right back here. And then this is the narrowest bar in 15 bars, but it does overlap this bar, so it's not an inside day. We did have a little bit of a wide range bar here. This is the widest in seven bars, but it really wasn't that impressive because the range is still pretty small in here. We had an inside day, but it's also the narrowest range within 15 bars. We did get a little expansion on the next day, but it's still an inside day going back two days. And then if you go back, three days, this day is an inside day of this, and this whole three days of trading is all with, contained within this wide range bar here. In fact, this bar too, if you, I had it drawn out, 
let's see, yeah, there's your inside day there. There we go. If you draw this line out from that wide range bar, we've got four days within that bar. So the more days you get within one wide range bar, the more compression that you get in the market. And the more compression you get, the more likely that market is to expand. Now, if we take a look at a barrage, starting with a four day, a six day, a 10 day, and working our way up, jumping a little bit, you know, the 20 and 30 and 40, and then 50 and then 100 day historical volatility, you can see that the volatility is all fairly low in here. Now, one thing I want to caution you when you're doing this hindsight research, notice that, and even though if I just, put, I went in and put in this day as the end point, but it still somehow picks up the next day in background, okay? So if I were to grab this chart, a live chart, and pull it to the left a little bit, yesterday's, I'm sorry, today's data would pop up, okay? So this is not forecasting anything here, this last little part, and notice that your this is a 10 day average true range, okay? And this is the one day average true range. So this little jump here didn't happen until today. Years ago, there was someone who wanted to start a hedge fund and he put me in touch with someone who was already running a hedge fund and he put me in charge of doing the research. And, he thought he had the holy grail, and one thing that he didn't realize, he was looking at the changes in the moving averages, and I don't know whether he was doing this consciously or not, but when I looked at the chart, it was pretty damn obvious that the moving averages would flip or turn up or flip up or flip down when there was like a big next day happening, and then I noticed that a lot of his buys in his system were when he saw that happening. Well, he was using paper charts for his analysis and lots and lots and lots of you know just books full of paper charts and unfortunately this you don't know that it's going to go up until that day so just a little something i want to throw out at you to be careful with now this is what happened so we did have that compression this is a 15 minute bar and you can see this thing just chopped around chopped around chopped around chopped around for several days in here this was an okay day here i think that was the bar that was the wide range bar in this particular case you can see it's a bit of an opening gap reversal so on top of looking for range expansions okay you might want to let it open make sure it doesn't make a huge move lower okay if it does you might have to go with it but if it reverses you can look to play the other direction so instead of so right here you're kind of watching gush but gush would be the same thing but to the upside that really didn't get going and then it made a nice little reversal and again I, I think i made money on that day i don't know if i printed money i have to go in and look but then you see it went back to being choppy 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 and we finally had a decent breakout today now i was a little gun shy and i didn't get in earlier just because i wanted the market to prove itself if this is going to be the mother of all wide range bars then surely it will carry further than just that little bit of a breakout there, okay? And in this particular case, I've been using 30 cents as an IPT and trailing the stop at 30 cents. So we hit the initial profit target and then stopped out on the remainder. Now, they haven't been a whole lot of these lately. The market has been really, really choppy. Hey Dave, nearly missed it. Challenging markets for sure. Yeah, it's it's been a little choppy in here lately. You know, never forget it's summertime, and I didn't want to get too far into this tonight. But the the old adage selling may and go away. Sometimes that works, but sometimes your best opportunities with a trend following methodology can actually happen in the summer. And then the other thing too, I was talking with one of you guys earlier today. And the dynamics of the markets are changing. We're seeing a lot of these, the, the RBL Lexus and a lot of these crazy go-go stocks, these momentum stocks, just have this unbelievable amount of volume. And we're just gonna have to continue to wrap our head around that. And, and it's all these Robinhood traders, I'm guessing, 
are all these new people, all this newfound interest, maybe some of the pandemic created some of this. I don't know, but it's definitely a, a, a different type of environment to where we could have a summer where we have a lot of momentum. Now, there's some troubles with the markets. Now, I'll talk out of both sides of my mouth. We'll take a look at those in a few minutes. Now, getting to the why you can't trade, and then I want to make sure I add in, unless you want to. And next week or next few weeks, I'm going to touch upon what you could do if you really want to, obviously. So I don't want to just throw out, I hate people to throw out a problem and be like, oh, it's a problem, you know, <laughs> what good does that do? But the number one reason you can't trade is it's harder than it looks. And I think that if you can't put a trading system on a cocktail napkin, then you should toss it out. And I, I think that more complex systems can be boiled down to much, much more simpler systems. And I'd be willing to bet that. And, and I've said this a thousand times before, but I'll be in these presentations. I'd never call anybody out, but somebody will show their system and there's all these buys and sells and buys and sells all over the place, 100 or so or whatever on the chart. And it's a trend. And if you look at just when it rose above the moving average, maybe put in a few bars of Landry light, and stayed long as as long it was above the moving average, then you'd have had two trades, a buy and a sell, and you'd have captured the entire trend instead of all the in and out, in and out, in and out that they did. Nothing wrong with all this research, and, and they might uh, have exception with all this HG uh, stuff I'm talking about and volatility research, so I get it. But for the basic core methodology, but methodology, easy for me to say, let me unstick my tongue. That's pretty much it. Identify a trend, figure out your entry, put your stop in a place where you would be wrong, okay, for at least a swing trade, and be able to at least ride out a swing trade, I should say. And then you want to have initial profit target and gradually loosen that stop. So here's my what I call my nutshell screen. Again, nice trend, a pullback. And by the way, I did have napkins made. I should have sent you guys some napkins when I sent out the, uh, I cleaned out my shelves and sent, and, uh, sent my books away. <laughs> I should have threw some napkins in. Anyway, an entry is if the market begins to rally, obviously you don't want to try to catch the falling knife. We put in a stop because we can be wrong on every trade. I'm gonna talk a lot about stops in a few minutes. And then we take partial profits on the swing trade. We kind of ratchet that stop up on a bit of a one-for-one -one basis on the first half of the position, although, as I've been saying quite a bit, and if you follow the service archives, www.davelander.com slash archives, you'll see that I'm a little bit more lenient on the first loaf, and that's, that's helped me to capture more both swing trades and longer-term trades, because if you get knocked out on a swing trade, then you're out of the position, and you'll never make any money on a longer-term trade, right? And believe me, it happens. We got knocked out one, knocked out of one today. It just flat out didn't work. It happens. Spell with a sign on that stage. So if we're blessed with that partial profit in the swing trade, at this point in time, our stop is brought up to break even, even if that happens intraday. So let's say we're looking for $20 a share. It hits $20 a share. Our stop is four points behind. We immediately bring that up to 16, which would be the same as our entry. And now we are free rolling, so to speak. And as that stock moves more and more in our favor, we gradually loosen the stop. That's it, I know. Well, I think one of the reasons why trading is so hard is because it looks so easy. The elbow is near, but try to bite it. And <laughs> how many of you try to bite your elbow the first time I said that? It's crazy, huh? I threw this one in last minute because it, it was a, I've got a whole plethora, like I said, of slides. And and I thought it was very relevant. And the bottom line is, and, and you know, do I always do it? No. Am I interviewing myself? Yes. But if you just follow a simple setup, something like a Landry Light pullback or a TKO or something like that, and that's all you did, and you make sure you put your stop in a place where you're obviously wrong, and then just simply do that math. You could do it on a spreadsheet. I'll give you the spreadsheet. In fact, if you're 
a member. It's under members resources, davelander.com slash members. And then you'll look at a little menu there and it says members resources. That's where the spreadsheet is. So you can track your own trades. Anyway, that automatically, if you could figure out your entry and your stop, then your initial profit target is already done for you. And then the, the amount of shares are calculated too. But anyway, as I've said a thousand times before we moved to this brand new house here that we built ourselves, well, we had built, I guess, we didn't build ourselves. <laughs> we were living in a much, 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 much older home. And then we've had a leaky pipe or something. My wife said, all you need to do is get your wrench and go and fix it. And then three hours later, soap and you know, phone a friend, four trips to the plumbing store. My wife went to the plumbing store once. I want four of everything you have in here. <laughs> because I'd sit her back and forth about six times. And it's never as easy as it looks on the surface. Now, along the lines of, of plumbers, and this is something that I added in late last minute, and I think it's important. Unlike doctors, lawyers, automatic transmission mechanics, and plumbers, there is no clearly defined career path when it comes to trading. People, and, and I see it happen over and over and over again. In my Trading Simplified shows, I've been talking a lot about how to think like a trader. And, and the reason I, or the inspiration for that, I should say, is that a friend of mine, his son was interested in Robinhood, and I said, yeah, it's a great app for kids. You know, I'm excited because it's bringing them into the markets. But as you get a little older, you probably want to move away from Robinhood and move into something bigger. So his kid got into it, then he got into it, and his wife got into it. And it's like, yeah, we want to be traders, Dave. We're going to watch your videos and, and all this other stuff. But as soon as the market goes against them, they make mistake. They make um they begin to reason why it shouldn't be going against them. So that was kind of the whole genesis of that. But anyway, if you want to become a plumber, after two to three years of education or apprenticeship, plus another year or two of plumbing experience, you can become a journeyman plumber. After another one to five years of professional plumbing experience, depending on the state, you're eligible to sit for the master plumbing exam. So there's a very clearly defined career path to be a plumber. Obviously, a uh, clearly defined career path to be a doctor or lawyer. Oops, I'm getting chills. A doctor, a lawyer, or an automatic transmission mechanic. Sorry about that. Anyway, so there is no clearly defined career path. And in the past, I have worked really hard to define that path. And I reached a point a few years back where I've, I've got horrible carpal tunnel in both um, hands and I've got a cube. I've already had one surgery on my elbow and, and there's more in, in the cards. And, and it's like, I can't keep living like this, I realized. And I said, you know, I'm also pretty inefficient trying to deal with, with one email at a time, one person at a time. It's like, I've got to figure out a way to let more people understand what I'm saying. And, and even though I thought I was giving all this one-on-one -on -one attention, come to find out I was inefficient in doing it. And once I created a learning management system, it's like all of a sudden things begin to click. And then the missing piece from that to bring all that together was having a Facebook group where we can all meet up, talk about trades. What do you think about this trade? What do you think about that trade? Hey, I'm going in on this. You guys want to join me, et cetera, et cetera. That has really helped out tremendously so I, I really think not to soft sell anyone here that's not a member but i really think through the membership i have created that career path and any question that is unanswered i did quite a few q a sessions and i no longer see the need to do any unless somebody really has something they really want me to cover in a lot of detail but i don't see the need to do any at least for a while is because we're covering all that through the daily interaction so I think I am working hard to define that career path. Now, the other reason, or another reason I should say that it's hard to trade is a lot of people wing it. And as I've said before, I could never figure out why people won't plan their trades. And then one day walking around the block, back when I lived where a block was about two miles in the country, I realized that the moment you plan your trade, you gotta put in a stop or have a stop in your plan. 
and you have to admit that you're wrong. Then there's a whole psychology on why we don't want to admit that we're wrong. And a lot of that type of psychology comes from Tversky and what's the other guy's name? Kennerman, who wrote Thinking Fast and Slow. And we talked about that in the Trade Simplified show, I think yesterday or the day before. And what's the guy's name? I got Michael Peterson in my mind because we started watching that silly documentary on him. But uh, who who wrote Liar's Poker and quite a few other of these books? Anyway, he wrote a book called The Undoing Project. And I'd recommend you read it. And it's about Tversky and Kannerman. And there's a lot of things in there. He kind of touches upon their research. One of my beefs, and not to, not to talk about everything I talked about in, in yesterday's stock chart show, but one of my beefs with these all these behavioral science, behavioral finance books, is after a while, they all kind of sound the same. And it seems like 90% of them come from <laughs> uh, thinking fast and slow. Now, thinking fast and slow is 500 something pages. It's not an easy read. Some of it's really fascinating, though. I know I'm a nerd. But I'd recommend you read that. And it's going to help to help you to understand. Uh, Dan Arley would be my other author, my go-to author when it comes to behavioral science and stuff. And then yesterday, I also referenced another book that's pretty good. Uh, Klein is his name, and it's uh, seeing what other people's people don't. Anyway, books to read. I have all those. www.daveblander.com. Books to read. Let me slow down here. Anyway, to acknowledge uncertainty was to admit the possibility of error. We don't like admitting that we're wrong. And as I've said a hundred times, I. Larry Williams' son wrote a book on trading. I can never think of the name of it. Let's see if I could grab it. No, not easily. Anyway, one of the things he suggested to do is take a personality test. And I took a personality test and found out that I scored about a zero. If I could have scored negatively, I would have in agreeableness. I didn't realize that I had such a problem. <laughs> I told my wife and daughters, and they looked at me like I pooed in my pants, as I've said before a thousand times. So that was kind of an epiphany for me. So that's one of the, the solutions possibly is, is getting to know yourself a little bit. So why do people wing it when it comes to trading? Well, it's obviously a lot more fun. And you don't have to admit ahead of time that you could be wrong. And that's something that I was kind of backing into a minute ago. It's like we don't like being wrong, nor do we want to admit that we could be wrong. And it's especially hard for someone like me, who is very, very low on the agreeableness scale. And, and that's part, without digressing too far, that's part of the onion of the trading psychology, trading neurology, that really kind of as it unfolds, it makes you feel better and better and better about yourself. You're like, why am I the only one struggling? Well, guess what? You're not the only one struggling, okay? I just I literally just, I had a shirt on that had F-bombs on it. <laughs> I literally just took it off and put this on. I should just left it on. I had some chicken grease on it though. They had to change it. But yeah, we all we all struggle in this and, and it's and it's an unnatural thing. And, and maybe some of that will come out through this presentation and hopefully some of, these, some of the others. If not, I've done a lot of stuff on that in the past. But for me, realizing that I did have this a problem with agreeableness, now I know when I when I have this stress and angst in the markets, it's like because the market is not doing what I think it should, and I am not a very agreeable person according to this <laughs> this thing. But I do try I do try to avoid arguments, especially the cocktail party, because I don't want to. I don't want to ruin my cocktails. Anyway, I digress. And, you know, here's the thing. When things start to go wrong, again, it's hard to admit that you're wrong. Like I said yesterday, having a little bit of that behavioral science, behavioral finance, whatever you want to call it, rear its ugly head, but it's like you have a bit of this anchoring effect. You buy something, like my nephew, he bought Bitcoin at $60,000, and then it went down to $30,000 or $40,000, wherever it was. And he's got that $60,000 in his head and he can't let go of his Bitcoin. 
Well, this is an example I've used a thousand times before. A buddy of mine came over and he said he bought this certain company because he likes the CEO and I like the CEO too. He's a nice guy. I met him just once, but like I said in uh, last week at Bandcamp and, and yesterday's show, or this was might have been last week's stock short show, he's a cool guy, a kind of guy you want to have a beer with, you know? And when I showed him this chart, he said, well, that that big blue arrow's in hindsight. And I said, well, hold on a minute. I'll give you your first buy way back on the left when it was choppy, maybe because you like the company, I like the CEO, but every subsequent buy was on its way down. And these are this is what you said. You bought some because it was low. You bought some because it was looks like it was it was couldn't go any lower. And then you bought some more when it was really cheap and you were thinking you're gonna flip it out, kind of a little bit of a martingale type of technique. And then I found out when I went to plot this chart about a year or two ago that the company is delisted and it's a penny stock, and I guess now a pink sheet stock, and it's only pennies on the dollar. And then he told me then that he bought some even more of this stock because it was so cheap. So he's holding on, on for dear life. I don't know why. I guess he wants to be right. We don't like to be wrong. I don't like to be wrong, okay? I have a 0% score and agreeableness. Following the plan is hard. And one of the hardest things about following a plan is that a lot of times it means apps doing absolutely nothing. And as I say quite often, trading done properly can be quite boring. You're either waiting for setups, and then if you found a setup, you're waiting for a trigger, and if you trigger in, you're waiting for it to move so you can get your initial profit target. And it's just a heck of a lot of waiting, as I've said many, many times. So this is one in the open portfolio, ARLP. And this was my don't micromanage example. And, and for a while I said, boy, I hope this really does take off. So it'll be the mother of all don't micromanage examples, just follow the plan. And the stop was probably around with that red line was a little bit lower maybe. And I'd be willing to bet most people probably got out, excuse me, at the first signs of adversity, probably right here. And if not right here, probably on one of these little sell-offs, even though the stop wasn't hit. I was in one today, and this was an intraday trade, and it had to go another six or seven or eight cents to hit the stop. And I'm like, ah, screw it. It's not working out. I went to exit at the market and I said, well, hold on, Dave. Could I survive if I let it go that extra six cents and hit my stop? How would I feel if I did that? And I was like, well, you know, Dave Landry says to follow your plan. And if your stop was at this level, then just let it go. And if I'd have gotten out, I would have had a loss on the trade. It would have been smaller than the extra six cents or whatever it was. So I would have saved that six cents, but believe it or not, and I've had this happen many a times, not all the time. If it happened every time, you'd never see my fat ass again. But the market actually turned around before it hit the stop, and then it rallied, and it was one of my winners on the day. It was JDUST, I think, J-D-S-T. But anyway, I'd be willing to bet that most people probably got out on those slides. Now, this is a little bit of a dated example, but I think it makes for a wonderful example. We had a TKO that triggered way back here, and then stop was down here, and you can see the trade immediately kind of failed miserably, but the stop was never hit. And then what happened? It took off nicely, very nicely, okay? And we bring our stop up because now we got the initial profit target out and we're free rolling on this position. I don't know what happened to it longer term. I could find out. If you go back to the archives and pull up somewhere around July of 2018, maybe June 2018, you could actually see the original recommendation. Now, I distinctly remember this one because I got an email when it gapped higher, I sold ARWR yesterday. So he sat in it 
for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 20 something days, okay? Over a month, but then it began to sell off a little bit, even though it wasn't anywhere near the stop, okay? And he just couldn't take the pain anymore. This happens over and over and over again. Now, to be frank, I have allowed myself to be taken out of many positions before the stop has been hit. I don't do it as much as I used to because I always think in a position, what if I were showing this live to you guys and girls? How can I justify getting out early? So I, I have gotten better at that. And I'll tell you where I'm really good at it. I'm really good at it in the trading service because the trading service, I lay out the entire trading plan. And it's like, oh, well, I guess if it stops hit, I need to get out. I guess if the stop is not hit, I have to stick with it. And there's many days, and believe me, it's kind of like I want you to feel as normal as I do or as crazy as I do when it comes to trading. But there's many days I get whacked in that core portfolio, especially now, as I was explaining earlier, we got in some of these down in the single digits, especially one of them, CPE. I don't know where it's in the 40s now or was at least. So we got in like at seven and now it's in the 40s and we've got on quite a few shares still, even with taking the partial profits. So the equity swings are much, much bigger. So maybe like a 1% or a percent and a half swing on, let's say, we'll say like a 100K account, that's $1,500, $1,500 in one day. And it's nowhere near the stop. So it's very painful to let this unfold. And that's where a lot of people just, they just can't stand the pain. So you have to have, you don't have patience. Steve Edmondson once said, I spent a lot of time researching things we ultimately don't do. How many nights, especially lately, since things have been a little choppy, where I sit here for a couple hours, go through a couple thousand stocks, and I can't find a setup to save my life. It used to bum me out because I feel like I need something for my work, right? But now I'm like, you know what? There's nothing to do. I don't have to put any capital into harm's way. So it doesn't bother me like it used to. And I also know that every night that I can't find a setup to save my life is putting me one step closer to finding a really good setup. And as I've said time and time again, and, and there's been more than one email, this poor guy's like, why do you have to pick on me every show? But a few years back, some guy said, hey, look, I'm taking a break. I, I'm, I'm going to stay subscribed to the service, but I don't see these setups for any while. I'm, I'm going to go do something else for a while. I'm going to go on vacation or whatever. And just take a break because I don't see any setups setting up anytime soon. You had a setup in two weeks. And like, you know what? I don't see any either. But I kept chipping away at it, chipping away at it. And the same day, later that day, I found two of the biggest winners of the year. Now, I don't know if he left for his vacation or what, or he took them or not, but there's a good chance that he missed them because he lost patience. Ken Lambert once said, doing nothing is harder than it looks. It is. We're not wired to sit on our arses. We're people of action. And I don't want to digress too far because we talked about it last week and probably the week before, especially the stock chart show. But I couldn't understand why people take such mediocre setups. Uh, very highly skilled, trained, intelligent people, doctors, lawyers, automatic transmission mechanics. And then the psychiatrist one day emails me and said, Dave, I got your answer. At least I think I do. It's because a doctor, a lawyer, or automatic transmission mechanic has to take whatever train wreck comes along and he doesn't have the luxury of waiting for the perfect pitch, so to speak, the perfect client. It's, 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 it's a mechanic. I love the mechanic that I have. And uh, he's a sweet little guy. And uh, he was telling me, because we, we had a car once that we we kept alive forever. I, I would keep it alive as a crown Vic. I would do a lot of the work myself because it was easy to work on and then he would do work on it. And, and then one day he finally said, it's about time to let it go. We're like, all right, yeah, we know it's time. But he told a story that he had a, uh, like a cousin who had a car and he worked on it, worked on it, worked on it. It was just a piece of crap. He just kept it running, kept it running, kept it running. He's like, oh my God, will he ever get rid of this thing? He said, hey, can we park it at your place to sell it? The guy's going to come pick it up. 
So the guy comes, picks it up, you know, he runs his starch and drives around the parking lot. He drives out of the parking lot, goes around the block, and then pulls it right back in. And he's like, okay, I need you to fix this, 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 this. And so it's like just when he thought he was getting rid of the car. But if he wants to stay a mechanic and stay in business, he has to work on that POS, right? So we can't sit around as, or you can't sit around as professionals, as a doctor, a lawyer, or automatic transmission mechanic, and just cherry pick your clients and everything. And I, I don't want to throw anybody in the bus, but somebody recently was telling me a story about somebody they work with thinks that they can go in and cherry pick their clients. Well, he's not going to be successful very long in his business, or he's not going to have a whole lot of business if he just does that. But I don't want to digress too far. Imagine that. Charlie Munger, not a big fan of fundamentals and value investing and that kind of stuff. To those who don't know Charlie, he's Warren Buffett's partner, but uh, he did write a good book on uh, Charlie Munger's, what's it, uh, Wit and Wisdom or something. It's about this big. I found it a couple days ago in my closet, so I have to dig it out. This is probably where I got this quote from. It takes character to sit there with all that cash and do nothing. I didn't get to where I am by going after mediocre opportunities. Well, that philosophy does work, obviously, with trend trading. And then, of course, the late, great Tom Petty says the waiting is the hardest part. Number five, logic doesn't often apply. I remember I recommended this stock, and I don't remember exactly where, but it was a pullback. It looked pretty good. And I think it was probably this pullback way back here, right? And it just went up and up and up and up. And I remember when I recommended it, somebody emailed me and said, look, it's five times sales. This makes no sense. So many shares are controlled by powers that be paid under two bucks. Well, I've never thought about that before, but that's interesting. Okay. So he basically confused the issue with facts and then the stock just shot up afterwards and doubled or more than doubled. So the market didn't really care about those things. In fact, I often say, and, and I guess after I said this once, somebody said, you pretty much already did. But one day I'm going to design a system where the company has to have no fundamentals or rotten fundamentals, but the technicals have to be there. And I guess I pretty much have because a lot of these companies, they wouldn't know earnings, uh, an earning, is that a way to say it? If it hit them in the ass, but they might go on to double or triple in the meantime. So don't confuse the issue with facts. And that's a hard part because everybody wants to interject logic into a lot of the stuff. And a lot of times there is no logic. Markets are based on the emotions of the participants. And as I preach, wrap your head around your own emotional behavior. And that helps you to wrap your head around the emotional behavior of others. Recently, I've been getting a little chewed up, like I've been saying throughout this presentation. First trade of the many has losses, right? <laughs> <laughs> something you've never heard, right? And it's like I've been a little gun shy on, especially on like the ancillary trades, okay? So maybe I'm waiting for a little bit more follow through. Maybe I'm taking some where I might've been a little bit more excited to take them in the past. So this reasoning has nothing to do with the fundamentals or anything else. It just has to do with the fact that I've been getting beat up a little bit. So I wanna make sure that I'm choosing my spots extra carefully. So the more you wrap your head around your own emotions in trading and in life, the more emotional you realize you are, okay? Take your personality test too, by the way. The easier it's it's going to be to wrap your head around your own feelings and why you're not following your plan, but more importantly, to understand how emotional the rest of the market is if you are a microcosm of it, and you are a microcosm of it. And even if you're a small trader, sometimes you can affect the market, okay? Let's say you hit the market, well, that that your price becomes the ass price, and that, that extra little penny might have been all it takes to trigger off somebody else's stop and so you actually had a little bearing, believe it or not, it might be like kind of a butterfly effect type of thing, believe it or not. But even as a small trader, sometimes you can do those things. 
Now, one thing that a lot of people don't realize, the one reason you, you don't want a loss and you will avoid a loss at all costs, even though basically trading is being willing to take your lumps, take your losses, get out the way. You know, if you could take your lumps and losses and keep them relatively limited and then allow yourself to have somewhat unlimited gains, then you've you've gained the system, you've beat the system, and you'll be a success. But losses make you feel really bad, and this is where the neurology comes in, and I heard this from Janice Dorn, I've also heard it from a lot of other people, the brain registers loss is 2.5 times more intensely than it feels gains, and that's part of the gambler's ruin, ruin. and uh, Mrs. Dorn Reference somebody else's article where the guy talked about the gambler's ruin, and in such, it's like you're constantly chasing that high. You feel really bad about a loss, okay, and you feel okay about a gain. It feels good, don't get me wrong, but it's proportionally you're going to feel much more pain from that loss. And that's the gambler's ruin because the gambler ends up chasing that high, that high of that, that win. Okay. And it's hard to, it's hard to get there. So people feel roughly twice as bad about a loss as a pleasure that comes from an equal gain. People go to great lengths to avoid pain. And that's Kennerman and Tversky who said these things. And I think it was Kahneman wrote Thinking Class and Slow, but it, it's a culmination of all the research that he and um, Tversky did today, together. Number seven, we like to deal in exacts. I get emails all the time, not from more established people like you people here tonight. But where exactly did you do this? Why exactly is this? Why exactly? The word exact comes up probably more often than any other word. And, you know, once again, it's like once you start quoting the Kahneman and Tversky, and I hope I got the names right. I should know by now. Man is a deterministic device thrown into a probabilistic universe. That's a mouthful right there, right? That's a lot. That's that's something to really take in. And trading is very probabilistic <laughs> at best, right? But we want to we want to deal with exacts, and trading is just you can't deal with exacts. Now, I actually found this slide and it really kind of fits in with what I'm talking about tonight is from a psychological perspective, we're just scratching the surface. And again, the need to be right, we have a strong need to be right, especially me who has 0% in agreeableness. And you're probably thinking like, well, I don't know if I want to hang out with you, Dave, you might be an ale. No, I just, I just won't argue, <laughs> especially if you're buying the beer, I, you know, whatever you say is right, you know? <laughs> we have a need to take action because the real world and trading world are two different worlds. That's a whole speech in and of itself. But in the real world, you got to save some lives, okay? Even though the life might not be too easy to save, or it might not even, you might not be able to save the life, but you, you better give it a shot, right? You can't sit around and wait for a healthy person to come along and lay up. You're still healthy. Good job. <laughs> We have this need for certainty, exacts, uh, and it's it's doesn't work that way, right? Need to avoid pain. You know, the getting to back to the need for certainty. A lot of emotional people out there, right? Okay, and they. I thought I'd do a presentation about quoting Marion Marion McClellan, which is the late mom of Tom McClellan. But people, everyone uses timing in their investments, or everyone uses timing in their trading. In this case. Some people buy when they have money, some people sell when they need money, and others use far more sophisticated methods. So I think a lot of the pandemic buying came from people sitting around at home, bored, the the checks. I think the I, one of you guys showed me the research or the, or the stats on it, but Robinhood accounts like tripled in value 
the assets on the management, so to speak, or how, I don't know how you say it, they're not on the management, whatever, assets in the roof, after the government sent out all these checks, all these kids started trading their money. So they had money. And, you know, what does that have to do with anything? How is that logical with the economics or the earnings or the situation in Nigeria? So your need for certainty is not going to be fulfilled because of the emotions and all these other things that could come into the market and cause you grief and screw up a perfectly good trade. As Mark Douglas said, all it takes is one a-hole to screw up a perfectly good trade. And you just wrap your head around that. I was speaking to some day traders years ago and I, I didn't know that they shorted the parabolics. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, I, I said, well, Douglas said, all it takes is one a-hole to screw up a perfectly good trade. It's, it's nice to meet you. And again, we also have a need to avoid pain. We'll do anything to avoid pain. I'm trying to think, uh, God give me the strength to face a fact, even though it might slay me. Who's that? That's um, something, it's like he's got a three word name, something or he's like a, a warrior or something. It'll come to me hopefully, <laughs> by the time I do the editing. We also have a need for positive feedback. And we have a lot of needs. We're very, we're very, very, very needy. And not the last week at band camp you, but Annie Dukes written a couple of good books specifically. Well, there's only two that I know of, but that relates to trading at least. One is thinking in bets, and in that she talks about a lot about separating luck from skill, and sometimes we do stupid things, and they turn out right, whether it's in life or in trading, and we've learned nothing, okay? We've learned that let's do that stupid thing again because we got that positive result. And in her second book, or the second book related to trading, or somewhat related to trading, how to decide, she calls that resulting. And a lot of people take the results and work backwards and think, oh yeah, well this this was a great trade because it worked and, and that's just not how it works. All right, uh, I often show live examples and sometimes old examples like tonight, showed you both. Those come straight from the archives for the trading service. If you're new to the trading service, come down here to see the recent services. And if you wanna see the archives longer term, they're not behind a firewall. And usually I update them, lately I've been updating dating them fairly quickly because there hasn't been a whole lot of new trades. So you can go in and see what's been happening lately. DaveLeonard.com slash archives. This trading service is on sale right now. If you go to my homepage and I'll put a link in here, DaveLeonard.com. And trading service, at least for now, does include the members area, FYI. Members area is only 47 bucks. Everybody here tonight, I think, is a member. And I think they'll tell you that that plus the Facebook group makes it all worthwhile. And it's certainly been worthwhile for me by getting some great ideas from not only just research ideas, but also some, some trades from you guys. So I want to thank you guys for putting those trades out there. So somebody was asking about the member resources. It's not in this menu here, but it used it, it is now. Okay. So this is an old screen. So somewhere, if you go to the homepage, DaveLeonard.com slash members, okay. Not the DaveLeonard.com homepage, but the members homepage. And you look down here, there's going to be a members resources. And that's what the spreadsheet and stuff is. There's all the courses in the members area. All right, let's hop into the live charts. You guys and girls want to start asking about individual stocks. Please do so now. All right, George says, Bruce Lee said to be like what? Yeah, two. Let's take a look at the piece. Let me get the application shared. All right, everybody should be seeing the S&P 500. So today was one of those, after all was said and done, a lot more was said than done. We pretty much ended in Flatsville. 
And speaking of Flatsville, you can see we haven't done or haven't had much forward progress in a while. In fact, we're actually a tiny bit lower now to look at it. Let's see if we can get it to measure. If we go back to this day here, whatever that is. Okay, that's May 7th. Okay, wow. Okay, so that's six weeks and change. As you can see where the market, based on the net net price measurement, and as I tell people, if you don't know anything about markets, first thing you do, first thing you should ever do is say, where's the market right now? Well, 42.21. All right, where was the market back in the middle of May? Oh, 43.21, well, you know, 4.231 or whatever it is. So that right there says, hey, it's lost a little bit of momentum. As you get a little bit more advanced, you can throw the bow tie moving averages in and proper order can really help you to keep you help to keep you on the right side of the market. 10 simple, greater than 20 exponential, greater than 30 exponential for uptrends and just the opposite for downtrends. And you're going to be shocked or fairly amazed, I should say, at how something as simple as that can help to keep you on the right side of the market. So the P's have lost some steam. I'd like to see them bust out to brand new highs and not look back for a while. I'd feel a heck of a lot better about the market if it did that. Now, speaking of busting out, NASDAQ tried to bust out today. So it's a bit mixed out there, as you're going to see in one second. NASDAQ is just uh, almost said something vulgar. <laughs> Back from my sailing days, we used to describe if you just bring in the, the, the sheet just a little bit, we had a, a description for that. But I've used it so often, I've, it's such a vulgar thing. But anyway, I, I caught myself. Anyway, it's uh, very close. It's one of those things away from all time highs. So let's give it the benefit of the doubt. But yeah, we could have a double and possibly a triple top work. And I sure would like to see a breakout and not look back for a while. Now the Rusty sold off fairly hard today, off its worst levels, but down a percent and change. So that's kind of an ugly day, not the end of the world, but it is stalling short of prior highs in here. Now, take a look at gold, the commodity, absolutely whacked today. And part of that was probably the dollar. Look at the dollar. I feel like Tiny L is, it's, it's huge. It's huge. <laughs> and look at the bow tie. It's coming together on a dollar. But wait, Dave, that doesn't make sense. The government is printing a bunch of money. Well, okay. Don't confuse the issue with facts. See, see that's why... I can trade because I'm a trend following moron, and you, not you guys, and you can't because you're confusing the issue with facts. It's kind of like I said a while back, I would get these emails, somehow I got into somebody's email list, Bitcoin's crap, Bitcoin's crap, oh, Bitcoin was $4,000, and then Bitcoin's made up, it's fake, blah, 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 blah. Okay, what's $12,000, and then, you know, all the way up to $60,000, and then, of course, I knew it was coming as soon as Bitcoin began to roll over, they sent out an email. Ah, we were right. It's like, well, you know, I'd rather be a moron, follow it up, get out, and then sit around and wait for it to go back up and then get back in, as opposed to pontificating my brilliance. Anyway, uh, that was definitely uh, a very, as I've said a thousand times, I was pissed off when I got called that. But I got over it and realized that, you know, when I fight the market, I lose money. When I'm just a moron and follow, around, follow along, not all the time, but most of the time, I do okay. Maybe I am a trend following moron. And that was a very uh, releasing type of moment. A lot of areas breaking down in here. So it's hard for me to get excited about the market. Now, of all these indices, the main ones at least, the P's and the NASDAQ, and ideally the Russell, or Rusty as we call it, make new highs, then I might not worry as much. But today's action was a little concerning. You got chemicals breaking down in here. You got the energies getting whacked pretty hard. Not the end of the world for the energies. Longer term, still looking kind of bullish. This has a TKO-ish look to it, although I don't like this drifting that we've seen recently. But maybe today's action fleshes that out a little bit or, or knocks some people out so it can go back up. So that's a little bit of concern. Metals and mining, on the other hand, not looking so good. You can see they began to implode today. And they're going to bow tie down really soon, as long as they stay below that 30-day exponential moving average. Gold, the stocks also imploded, so they look like they could be in trouble. Ditto for 
silver. Now, as you go through a lot of these areas, you can see they're they're trying to roll over conglomerates, consumer durables, consumer non-durables. Foods look like they're losing a little steam in here. Banks, a little concerned about the banks. They've lost quite a bit of steam. They broke out nicely from this base. And now it looks like they're trying to go back and challenge that base. I've been long a bank forever. I always forget it, the name of it. EBC, or I'll put it in the post. But now I need to see where my stop is, and I might need to allow myself to be stopped out of it and say so long, thanks for all the fish. Insurance, look at that, breaking down in here, could bow tie down soon. So today was a little uglier than it would appear, would appear on the surface. Maybe there's a little vic, uh, vicious sector rotation happening, and maybe that'll unwind itself, and we'll see. And maybe enough other sectors will do well to where we won't have to worry about it. Drugs recently broke out all-time highs, just pulled back, had a good day today. They're looking pretty darn good. Biotech, as a general statement, has been improving as of late. I'd like to see all-time highs, but not going to complain there. Health services had a bang-up day. It looks like they want to try to get back to the old highs. They lost a little steam in here, but now they're beginning to improve again. Retail's lost steam, but had a good day today. So some areas are improving. A lot of areas are not. We had FedEx as a potential short on the Landry list. It broke down today, as you can see. And that's probably no surprise. The transports are kind of breaking down in here. So that's looking a little ugly. So it's going to be interesting to see if something bigger is unwinding. There's a lot of people that think the transports are very important. I guess it goes all the way back to Dow theory. And it seems like, oh, they're not as important, not as important. But I don't know. You still have to move goods. And like I said recently, we still get a lot of those little brown boxes with the smiles on them on our front porch. Software doing okay, just shy of all-time highs. I like to see it make it to new highs and get past this little peak in here. Simis is an area that I really like to pay attention to. They had an okay day today, just shy of all-time highs, but you still have to get there. I like to see them just get past these prior peaks in here. So overall, I think it's still kind of mixed in there, out there, I should say. Take a look at bonds. It's kind of interesting. Off their best levels, but a decent day nonetheless. Dave, the Fed is printing money and the interest rates will go up. Okay, you know, maybe we'll end up with the, where's my Zimbabwe note? Right there. You know, maybe someday we'll have the, the you know, crazy interest rates and the, and the hundred trillion dollar note. I don't know, the camera's probably not on autofocus. Let's see, is it there? Yeah, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> anyway. So a lot of interesting developments, at least to me. I'm a nerd, but why are bonds going up when the government's printing money? I don't know. I don't care. I'm just a trend following moron. All right. David, for his ETF profit centers, have Drip, Gush, JDS, LabD, LabU. That's the main ones I follow. Um Admittedly, I don't think I've ever made much money in nail. You know, maybe I got it. Maybe it's a little too late to the game on that one. Um, but it's it seemed like it was a pretty good one, but the spread's pretty bad on that. I just like the J Dust, the J Nug. I'm trying to think of what's the other ones that's that's not the juniors. Um, but I've had best luck with the Lab D, the Lab U, the Drip, the Gush, the J Dust. And uh, oh, Sox S and Sox L, you're forgetting about those. So it's four pairs. And those are the ones I've been studying the most lately. And I was really, really consistent not that long ago with these. And then I've been getting chewed up lately, like I said. And that's what had, has me dusting off a lot of that research. I was kind of humbled. I was feeling to a point where, oh, I'll just, you know, take this. This will be my, this will be my fun money account. And I'll just, Run out and buy some toys or whatever out of this account, uh, or at least taking that money from the other account from those trades because it was just like clockwork. Every day I would, at 3 p.m. my time, which is when the market closes, I would I would transfer half the funds out, and it was it's been kind of fun for a while. And then of course that comes to screeching halt. Like Linda Rasky says, right when you figure out the key to the markets, they change the locks, and in some cases, it's pretty, it's pretty easy 
um, to see, especially if you're looking at somebody else's trade. An example I use all the time is a client who's also a good friend of mine. We've been friends for forever. We've never met in person, but we've, we've threatened to get together and drink some beer and talk about markets and do some other stuff, maybe some fun stuff too. Um, anyway, he's a good scalper and he really has a talent for it. And it was quite, it's quite humbling because, you know, I've been at this forever and he's been at it for a long time too, but he's not a trader by profession. He's a doctor. And long story endless, like we said, he was, he was scalping Boeing and just printing money and then it stopped working and he, he had this affinity for Boeing because he, he was making so much money. I mean, how could you, how could you leave it behind? It was his uh, favorite girl, right? Well, sometimes you have to break up <laughs> when they no longer work, right? And in that case, it was pretty obvious the volatility was this and it just took a nosedive. It's like, aha, that's why the scalping's not working anymore because the volatility took a nosedive. So as in his words, he said, quoting Rasky too, he said, yeah, I had to keep the markets, they change the locks. All right, do you prefer a certain type of Vanguard or direction ETFs? Um, I'm not familiar with the Vanguard ones. I don't know if, if I think the directions, uh, Directione, however you say it. Okay, Sox S is Direction and Sox L is Direction Drip. Let's see what Drip is, oops. DRIP. Yeah, that's direction. Gosh, well, gosh, obviously. Soxel, drip, lab D. Yeah, and um, which one am I leaving out? J Dust. Yeah, those are all, those are my four favorites right now. I ventured out when I was doing really well, I ventured out into the other ones and didn't do as well. And, and uh, so I've throttled it back. Um, I think I have Charlie Kirk. I, let's see what I have. These are all, I think I have the directional ones here. So there's quite a few other ones, but I just like those four for now. Every now and then I'll toy around with uh, Fang D and Fang U. And I don't really know if I've made a lot of money in those two to make it worthwhile. Although it looks like we had a, a decent day today. It'd be fun to go in and do that uh, at volatility studies. I know you want to party with me. All right, Jeff wants to talk about gel, GEL. Ooh, that looks good. Um, I'm trying to think if I saw this one earlier. Yeah, I did. See, I've got a little line in here. This, I think, is on tonight's Landry list. The only thing I don't like about it, and maybe it's a good problem to have, because I remember thinking, ooh, do we want to trade this one or not? The only thing I don't like is you've got a mountain of overhead supply and markets have very, very, very long memories. Like the chart I just showed you where a buddy of mine bought stock, bought stock, bought stock. I like the way it broke out of this base and then took off and then pulled back. So I'm gonna give you a high five on that one. And I guess it'd be a good problem to have if it went to 18 and, and hit some overhead supply. But yeah, that looks pretty darn good. I like that. In fact, it should be, if it's not in tonight's, Landry list. It should be, and if it's not, it's because of the overhead supply. MGI. It's going to be what MoneyGram. MGI. Um, I like a you know getting back to the one we just had. I like a a pullback after multi-year highs. Okay, so clear air, something like um, well CP when it did the bow tie. I like a C I like a bow tie for multi-year lows. No, that's not going to be a good example I'm trying to show you. But this is a good enough example here. You're at new highs. You're pulling back a little bit. Let's take a look at MGI. MoneyGram, you're kind of dealing with a, with a high-level uh, peak in here. Now, if this is at low levels, I'm okay with that. That's kind of a cup and handle type of pattern. So I just don't like the cup and handle look at, at high levels like this. Years ago, I, I, I did, in case you're going back to like early two late 90s early 2000 uh up until like march 9th i think uh it seems like everything works and the high level cup and handles work pretty good but i know a lot of people who who like high level cup and handles like charlie kirk and all i think he's he'll often show them but 
I'm just not a fan because the trading pullbacks, I like the pullback to come off a brand new high. It's kind of like this one back here, although it didn't work perfectly. Joe, copy. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Um, you know, nice uptrend, a little bit of a pullback. It's a commodity, can be a little choppy. It's kind of thin. Uh, commodities, I give them a little bit more of a pass, especially because this is a highly derived commodity. I don't know where they get their uh, price from, but if it's off of futures, it can it it can it can be very tricky. Kind of like the, all that Vixie stuff that nobody understands, okay, except for Larry Bill and other than that. But yeah, that looks okay. Um, I don't know how thin it is when you go to trade it. I don't know how the spread is. I would never trade a stock this thin, but sometimes a, an ETF or maybe even ETN can trade. There's some people that never trade ETNs because they're kind of fake and made up, but I'm okay with that. I don't, I don't mind. I don't confuse the issue with facts. So yeah, Paul, that looks pretty good. All right, John says that gel is on the Landry list. All right, you got a freebie. CHK, did we talk about that one? CHK. Yeah, CHK looks okay. Um, it's an IPO or IPO-ish, or I think a lot of these are coming, like I passed on Weatherford because it didn't, I didn't know whether it was a new issue or not for a buy at B, which looks like it would have worked okay for a day or two, would have gotten some money out of that. Um, I'd like to see a little bit more pullback, but in I, with IPOs, sometimes I'm a little bit more lenient. They don't have to pull back as much, much. So just make sure that this is a true IPO and not one of these energy companies they're bringing back or whatever. But, you know, maybe they're bringing it back. They they went, went through bankruptcy, so they didn't have to pay anybody. And they just come back on from the market. I don't know. So maybe it's better this time, but we'll see. Uh, a little bit more pullback, but yeah, good eye on that one. Do you have any Van Gogh and funds in mind you want me to take a look at just to, to see if they might be worthwhile? I have a list of uh, some other ones in here. I have to check. Uh, Charlie Kirk does a lot of ETF type of work. So this is a, an ETF. I could export this and give it to you guys in the Facebook group. But I like those direction ones, or however you say it for now. I, I haven't had much luck trading these country funds just because most of the move happens overnight. I, I suppose you could buy and hold something like that. But for now, I like the, I don't know how you say it, direction funds or direction funds. All right, any more stock picks? Any more stock questions? Going once, going twice. All right, well, as usual, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Any, anything unanswered, if you're in Facebook, obviously, just bring it up to the group. We'll uh, we'll noodle with it a little bit. And if you're not in a group, davelander.com slash contact is my, you can reach me through that link. Everybody have a great night. And if we don't talk again, everybody have a great weekend. Thank you so much.